Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. Ladies and gentlemen, you all have one thing in common. You're all being blackmailed. For some considerable time, all of you have been paying what you can afford, and in some cases more than you can afford, to someone who threatens to expose you, and none of you know who's blackmailing you, do you? Oh, please. I've never heard of anything so ridiculous. I mean, nobody can blackmail me. My life is an open book. I've never done anything wrong. Anybody else wish to deny it? Very well. As everyone here is in the same boat, there's no harm in my revealing some details, and my instructions are to do so. I think you might spare us this humiliation. I'm sorry. Professor Pluck, you were once a professor of psychiatry specializing in helping paranoid and homicidal lunatics suffering from delusions of grandeur. Yes, but now I work for the United Nations. So your work has not changed. But you don't practice medicine at the UN. His license to practice has been lifted, correct? Why? What did he do? You know what doctors aren't allowed to do with their lady patients? Yeah. Well, he did. <laughs> oh, disgusting. Are you making moral judgments, Mrs. Peacock? How then do you justify taking bribes? In return for delivering your husband, Senator Peacock's vote to certain lobbyists. My husband is a paid consultant. There's nothing wrong with that. Not if it's publicly declared, perhaps. But if the payment is delivered by slipping used greenbacks and plain envelopes under the door of the men's room, how would you describe that transaction? I'd say it stinks. Well, how would you know? When were you in that man's, men's room? What's true? Well, no! It's a vicious lie! I'm sure we're all glad to hear that. But you've been paying blackmail for over a year now to keep that story out of the papers. Well, I'm willing to believe you. I, too, mean blackmail for something I didn't do. Me, too. And me. Not me. You're not being blackmailed? Oh, I'm being blackmailed, all right. But I did what I'm being blackmailed for. What did you do? Well, to be perfectly frank, I run a specialized hotel and a telephone service, which provide gentlemen with the company of a young lady for a short while. Oh, yeah. What's the phone number? So how did you know Colonel Mustard works in Washington? Is he one of your clients? Certainly not. I was asking Miss Scarlett. Well, you tell him it's not true. It's not true. Is that true? No, it's not true. Ha <laughs> ha! So it is true! A double negative! A double negative? You mean you have photographs? That sounds like a confession to me. In fact, the double negative has led to proof positive. I'm afraid you gave yourself away. Are you trying to make me look stupid in front of the other guests? You don't need any help from me, sir. That's right. But seriously, I don't see what's so terrible about Colonel Mustard visiting a house of ill fame. Most soldiers do, don't they? No, please. But he holds a sensitive security post in the Pentagon. And Colonel, you drive a very expensive car for someone who lives on a Colonel's pay. I don't. I came into money during the war when I lost my mommy and daddy. Mrs. White, you've been paying our friend the blackmailer ever since your husband died under, shall we say, mysterious circumstances. <laughs> why is that funny? I see. That's why he was lying on his back in his coffin. I didn't kill him. Then why were you paying the blackmailer? I don't want a scandal, do I? We'd had a very humiliating public confrontation. He was deranged, lunatic. 
He didn't actually seem to like me very much. He had threatened to kill me in public. Why would he kill you in public? I think she meant he threatened in public to kill her. And was that his final word on the matter? Being killed is pretty final, wouldn't you say? And yet he was the one who died. Not you, Mrs. White. Not you. What did he do for a living? He was a scientist. Nuclear physics. What was he like? He was always a rather stupidly optimistic man. I mean, I'm afraid it came as a great shock to him when he died. But he was found dead at home. His head had been cut off, so had his, uh, you know. I had been out all evening at the movies. You miss him? Well, it's a matter of life after death. Now that he's dead, I have a life. But he was your second husband. Your first husband also disappeared. Well, that was his job. He was an illusionist. But he never reappeared. He wasn't a very good illusionist. <clears throat> I have something to say. I'm not going to wait for Wadsworth here to unmask me. I work for the State Department, and I am a homosexual. Now, I, I feel no personal shame or guilt about this, but I must keep it a secret or I will lose my job on security grounds. Thank you. Well, that just leaves Mr. Body. What's your little secret? His secret? Oh, hadn't you guessed? He's the one who's blackmailing you all. Interior, 74 Chevy, moving, morning. An old, gas-guzzling, dirty, white 1974 Chevy Nova barrels down a homeless, ridden street in Hollywood. In the front seat are two young fellas, one white, one black, both wearing cheap black suits with thin black ties under long green dusters. Their names are Vincent Vega, white, and Jules Winfield, black. Jules is behind the wheel. Okay, now tell me about the hash bars. Do what you want to know. Well, hash is legal there, right? I mean, yeah, it's legal, but it ain't 100% legal. I mean, you can't just walk into a restaurant, roll a joint, and start puffing away. You're only supposed to smoke in your home or certain designated areas. Those are the hash bars? Yeah, uh, it breaks down like this. It's legal to buy it. It's illegal to own it. If you're the proprietor of a hash bar, it's illegal to sell it. It's illegal to carry it, which doesn't really matter, because get a load of this. If the cops stop you, it's illegal for them to search you. Searching you is a right the cops in Amsterdam don't have. Well, that did it, man. I'm fucking going. That's all there is to it. I know, baby. You dig it the most. <laughs> you know what the funniest thing about Europe is? What? It's a little differences. I mean, a lot of the same shit we got here, they got there, but there, they're just a little different. Examples? Well, in Amsterdam, you can buy a beer in a movie theater. And I don't mean in a little paper cup either. I mean like a glass of beer, like at a bar. In Paris, you could buy a beer at McDonald's. <laughs> you know what they call a quarter pound with cheese in Paris? They don't call it a quarter pounder with cheese? No, man, they got the metric system. They don't know what the fuck a quarter pounder is. So what do they call it? A Royale with cheese. <laughs> Royale with cheese. <laughs> I know. what they call a Big Mac? Uh, I mean, a Big Mac's a Big Mac, but they call it La Big Mac. Uh, a Big Mac. What do they call a Whopper? Well, I don't know. I didn't go to Burger King. But you know what they put on French fries and Holland instead of ketchup? What? Mayonnaise. <laughs> God damn. 
I've seen them do it too. And I don't mean like a little bit on the side of the plate. They fucking drown them in it, man. <sighs> Yeah. I know. Interior Chevy trunk morning. The trunk of the Chevy opens up. Jules and Vincent reach inside, taking out two forty-five automatics, loading and cocking them. We should have shotguns for this kind of deal. How many up there? Three or four. Counting our guy? I'm not sure. So there could be five guys up there. It's possible. We should have fucking shotguns. They close the trunk. Interior women's lounge night. Sugar comes in, followed by Josephine with the cake of ice. Put it here. Sugar, you're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble if you're not careful. You better keep a lookout. If Bardstock catches you again, but what's the matter with you anyway? I'm not very bright, I guess. I wouldn't say that. Careless, maybe. No, just dumb. If I had any brains, I wouldn't be on this crummy train with this crummy girl's band. Then why did you take this job? I used to sing with male bands, but I can't afford it anymore. Afford it? Have you ever been with a male band? Me? That's what I'm running away from. I worked with six different ones in the last two years. <laughs> oh, brother. Rough? I'll say. You just can't trust those guys. I can't trust myself. The moment I'd start with the new band, bingo. Bingo? You see, I have this thing about saxophone players. Really? Especially tenor sax. I don't know what it is, but they just curdle me. All they have to do is play eight bars of Come to Me, My Melancholy Baby, and my spine turns to custard, and I get goose pimples all over, and I come to them. Is that so? Every time. You know, I play tenor sax. <laughs> but you're a girl, thank goodness. Yeah. That's why I joined this band, Safety First. Anything to get away from those bums. Yeah. You don't know what they're like. You fall for them and you love them. You think it's going to be the biggest thing since the Groff Zeppelin. And the next thing you know, they're borrowing money from you and spending it on other dames and betting on the horses. You don't say. Then one morning you wake up and the saxophone is gone and the guy is gone. And all that's left behind is a pair of old socks and a tube of toothpaste all squeezed out. Men. So you pull yourself together and you go on to the next job and the next saxophone player. And it's the same thing all over again. See what I mean? Not very bright. Brains aren't everything. Well, I can tell you one thing. It's not going to happen to me again, ever. I'm tired of getting the fuzzy end of the lollipop. Ice, what's keeping the ice? The natives are getting restless. How about a couple of drinks for us? Sure. You know, I'm going to be 25 in June. You are? That's a quarter of a century. Makes a girl think. How about what? About the future. You know, like a husband. That's why I'm glad we're going to Florida. What's in Florida? Millionaires. Flocks of them. They all go south for the winter like birds. Going to catch yourself a rich bird? Oh, I don't care how rich he is. As long as he has a yacht and his own private railroad car and his own toothpaste. Oh, you're entitled. Well, maybe you'll meet one too, Josephine. Yeah, with money like Rockefeller and shoulders like Johnny Weissmuller. I won't mind to wear glasses. Glasses? Men who wear glasses are so much more gentle and sweet and helpless. Haven't you ever noticed? Well, now that you mentioned it, they get those weak eyes from reading. You know, all those long columns of the tiny figures in the Wall Street Journal? That bass fiddle. Wow, she sure knows how to throw a party. Happy days. I hope you end up with the sweet end of the lollipop.
Highway, dawn. A police car pulls into the foreground and its driver door opens, showing the seal of the Brainerd Police Department. Marge gets out. Hiya, Lou. Margie, thought you might need a little warm up. Yeah, thanks a bunch. So what's the deal now? Gary says triple homicide? Yeah, it looks pretty bad. Uh, two of them are over here. Ah, geez. So, ah, geez. Here's the second one. It's in his head and the hand there. I guess that's a defensive wound. Okay. Hey, where's the state trooper? Uh, back there, a good piece in the ditch next to his prowler. Okay. So we got a trooper pull someone over. We got a shooting and these folks drive by. And we got a high speed pursuit. Ends here in this execution type deal. Yeah. I'd be very surprised if our suspect was from Brainerd. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, from his footprint, he looks like a big fella. You see something down there, Chief? Uh, I just, I think I'm gonna bark. Jeez, you okay, Margie? I'm fine. Just morning sickness. Well, that passed. Yeah? Yeah. Now I'm hungry again. You had breakfast yet, Margie? Oh, yeah. Norm made some eggs. Yeah? Uh, well, now what do you think? Let's go take a look at that trooper. There's two of them, Lou. Yeah? Yeah. This guy's small and his buddy. For Pete's sake. How's it look, Marge? Well, he's got his gun on his hip there, and he looks like a nice enough guy. It's a real shame. Yeah. You haven't monkeyed with his car there, have you? No way. And somebody cut his lights. I guess the little guy sat in there waiting for his buddy to come back. Yeah, it would have been cold out here. Oh, heck yeah. Hey, you think is Dave open yet? Y you don't think he's mixed up in old... Oh, no, no, no. I just want to get Norm some night crawlers. You look in a citation book? Uh, yeah. Last vehicle he rode in was a Tan Sierra at 2.18 a.m. Under the plate number, uh, he put DLR, so I got the state looking for a Sierra with a tag starting DLR. They don't got no matches yet. Uh-huh. I figured they stopped him or shot him before he could finish filling out the tag number. Hmm. I'm not sure I agree 100% on your police work there, Lou. Yeah? Yeah. I think that vehicle there probably had dealer plates. DLR? Oh. Jeez. Yeah. Say, Lou, you hear the one about the guy who couldn't afford personalized plates, so he went and changed his name to J2L 4685? Uh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Please sit down on the sofa. As Norman goes about spreading out the bread and ham and pouring the milk, we follow Mary across the room. She studies the birds as she walks and briefly examines a bookcase stacked with books on the subject of taxidermy. She notices too the paintings on the wall, nudes primarily, and many with vaguely religious overtone. Finally, Mary reaches the sofa, sits down, and looks at the spread. You're very kind. It's all for you. I'm not hungry. Please, go ahead. Mary begins to eat, her attitude a bit tense. She takes up a small slice of ham, bites off a tiny bite, nibbles at it in the manner of one disturbed and preoccupied. Norman gazes at her, at the tiny bite she has taken. <laughs> you eat like a bird. You know, of course. Not really. I hear that expression, uh, that one eats like a bird, it's really a falsity. I mean a, a falsity, because birds eat a tremendous lot. You know I, I don't know anything about birds. My hobby is stuffing things. Taxidermy? 
And I guess I just rather stuff birds because, well, I hate the look of beasts when they're stuffed. Foxes and chimps and all. Some people even stuff dogs and cats. But I can't. I think only birds look well stuffed because they're rather passive to begin with, most of them. It's a strange hobby, a curious, I mean. Uncommon too. I imagine so. It's not as expensive as you think. Cheap, really. Needles, thread, sawdust. The chemicals are all that cost anything. A man should have a hobby. It's more than a hobby. Sometimes. A hobby is supposed to pass the time, not fill it. Is your time so empty? Oh, no. <laughs> no, I run the office, tend the cabins and grounds, do little chores for mother. The ones she allows I might be capable of doing. You go out with friends? Friends? Who needs friends? <laughs> A boy's best friend is his mother. You've never had an empty moment in your whole life, have you? Only my share. Where are you going? I, I don't mean to pry. I... I'm looking for a private island. What are you running away from? Uh, why do you ask that? No, people never run away. Hmm, the rain didn't last very long. You know what I think? I think we're all in our private traps, clamped in them, and none of us can ever climb out. We scratch and claw, but only at the air, only at each other, and all for, for what? We never budge an inch. Sometimes we deliberately step into those traps. I was born in mine. I don't mind it anymore. You should mind it. Oh, I do. But I say I don't. <laughs> if anyone ever spoke to me the way I heard, the way she spoke to you, I don't think I could ever laugh again. Sometimes when she talks that way to me, I'd like to curse her out and leave her forever. Or at least defy her. But I couldn't. She's ill. She sounded strong. I mean, ill. She had to raise me all by herself after my dad died. I was only five. And it must have been a strain. Oh, she didn't have to go out to work or anything. Dad left us with a little something. Anyway, a, a few years ago, mother met a man. He talked her into building this motel. Oh, we could have talked her into anything. And, and when, well, it was just too much for her when he died. And the, the way he died, well, it's nothing to talk about when you're eating. Anyway, it was too much of a loss for my mother. She had nothing left. Except you? A son is a poor substitute for a lover. Uh, why don't you go away? To a private island like you? Uh, no, not like me. It's too late for me. And besides, who'd look after her? She'd be alone up there. The fire would go out, damp and cold, like a grave. When you love someone, you don't do that to them, even if you hate them. Oh, I don't hate her. I, I hate what she's become. I hate the illness. Wouldn't it be better if you put her in some place? An institution? A madhouse? People always call a madhouse some place. 
put her in some place. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it to sound uncaring. What do you mean about caring? Have you ever seen one of those places inside, laughing and tears and cruel eyes studying you? And my mother there? Why? Has she harmed you? She's as harmless as one of those stuffed birds. I am sorry. I only felt it seemed she was harming you. I, I meant... Well? You meant well? People always mean well. They cluck their thick tongues and shake their heads and suggest so very delicately that... I've suggested it myself. But I hate to even think such a thing. She needs me. And it isn't... It isn't as if she were a maniac, a raving thing. It's, it's just that sometimes she goes a little mad. We all go a little mad sometimes, haven't you? Yes, and just one time can be enough. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Norman. Uh, Norman. You're not going to, to your room already. I'm very tired, and I'll have a long drive tomorrow, all the way back to Phoenix. Phoenix? I stepped into a private trap back there, and I want to go back and try to pull myself out before it's too late for me, too. Why don't you stay a while, just for talking? I'd like to, but... All right. Um, I'll see you in the morning. I'll bring you breakfast. What time do you think you'll... Uh, very early. Dawn. All right, Miss... A crane. That's it. Good night. Mike, outrageously drunk, arrives at Dexter's house, screaming out his name. CK Dexter Haven? CK Dexter Haven. Now, this is where Cinderella gets off. Now, you hurry back to the ball before you turn into a pumpkin and six white mice. <laughs> Goodbye. CK Dexter Haven. CK Dexter Haven. Dexter enters, newly awakened, putting on his bathrobe. What's up? You are. <laughs> I only hope it's worth it. Come on in. I bring you greetings. Cinderella's slipper, it's called champagne. Champagne is a great leveler. Leveler. It makes you my equal. I wouldn't quite say that. Well, almost my equal. CK Dexter Haven, I would like to talk to you. Let's go in the talking room. Don't tell me the party's over so soon. <sighs> no, no, I just felt like talking to you. Well, that's nice. <sighs> oh, I wonder if I might borrow a drink. Certainly. Coles to Newcastle. Here, sit down. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, what's this? Is it my book? Yes. C.K. Dexter Haven, you have unsuspected depth. Oh, thanks, old chap. But have you read it? I was trying to stop drinking. I read anything. And did you stop dr Drinking? Yes. Your book didn't do it, though. Are you still in love with her? Or perhaps you consider that a very personal question? Not at all. Liz thinks you are. 
Liz thinks you are. But of course, women like to romana romanticize about things. Yes, they do, don't they? Yes, they do, don't they? I don't know, I can't understand how you could have been married to her and still know so little about her. Can't you? No, I can't you. <laughs> I have the... I have the hiccups. I, I wonder if I might have another drink. Certainly. Thank you. <laughs> you know, Tracy's no ordinary woman. And you said some things to her this afternoon I resented. I apologize, Mr. Connor. Oh, that's quite all right, quite all right. When a girl is like Tracy, she's one in a million. She's sort of like a, sort of like a... Goddess? No, 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 no. You said that word this afternoon. No, no, she's, she's sort of like a queen. A radiant, glorious queen. You can't treat her like other women. Oh, I suppose not. But then I imagine Kittredge appreciates all that. Kittredge! Oh, Kittredge appreciates Kittredge. A fake man of the people. He isn't even smart. He's a five cent edition of Sydney Kid. Well, I always thought Kid was the five cent kid. <laughs> and what's that make you, CK Dexter Haven, bringing us down here? <laughs> but you know why I did that? To get even with my ex bride. You told me so yourself. Doggone it, CK Dexter Haven. Either I'm going to sock you. Or you're gonna sock me. Shall we toss a coin? Oh? Huh? You know kids just use you like he uses everybody else. You don't know kid like I know him. The guy's colossal. He's terrific. He's got everybody fooled. Yes. No mean Machiavelli is smiling, cynical Sydney kid. The world's his oyster with an R in every month. <laughs> When did I say that? You didn't. I did. Sorry. Uh, I suppose you've never heard of a kid's arrangement in Kansas City. No. In San Francisco. Let me tell you about the time you went to Boston to be awarded the Sarah Langley Medal for World Peace. The true story on that little jaunt would ruin him. Look, Connor. What would happen to you if I used this stuff? Why? Well, I might want to very much. You see, Kid is holding a dirty piece on Tracy's father. This might stop. Oh, on Tracy's father? That's right. Oh. Oh, so that's how Kid got you to. That's how Liz and I were gotten in. Blackmail, huh? We all rode into this thing on a filthy blackmail. Well, look. You use it. Use it with my blessings. I'm cooked. I'm through anyway. I'm not going to hand in a story on this wedding. I'm going to write one on Kid. No, let me do it. I don't have to tell him where I got my facts, okay? Okay. All right, come on. Now, shoot. Peace medal. Hmm? Austin. Oh, oh! The time... May 1938. The place, Boston, in a hotel. Kid. Ooh. I just arrived. And the same Sydney kid, ladies and gentlemen of America, this uh, oh, protector of American democracy and homes and firesides is at that very moment entering the South Carolina by the hurry on his yacht. Don't interrupt me! It's Sydney Kidd, ladies and gentlemen. You come for the body of Macaulay Connor? Who? I'm so glad you came. The respect. Can you use a typewriter? Oh. No thanks, I have one at home. Who is Who's Sydney that, Tracy? Where's Kidbridge? The people's choice. Yeah. Good. His yeah. bride just dropped him at the gatehouse after a slight explosion. A fight? Fifteen rounds, no decision. Where's my wandering parakeet?
A picnic spread is laid out. A tablecloth, two goblets, and between them, a small leather wine container, and some cheese and a couple of apples. The picnic is set on a lovely spot, high on the edge of a mountain path, with a view all the way back to the sea. The man in black comes running up around the path, sees Vicini, and slows. So now, it is down to you, and it is down to me. If you wish her dead, by all means, keep moving forward. Let me explain. <laughs> there is nothing to explain. You are trying to kidnap what I have rightfully stolen. Perhaps an arrangement can be reached. There will be no arrangement, and you're killing her. If there can be no arrangement, then we are at an impasse. I fear so. I cannot compete with you physically, and you are no match for my brains. You are that smart. Let me put it this way. Ever heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates? Yes. Morons. Really? Well, in that case, I challenge you to a battle of the wits. For the princess, To the death, I accept. Then pour the wine. As Vicini fills the goblets with dark red liquid, the man in black pulls a small packet from his clothing and drops it by the wine. Open that and inhale, but do not touch. I smell nothing. What you do not smell is Iocane powder. It is odorless, tasteless, dissolves instantly in liquid, and is among the deadlier poisons known to man. Hand me the goblets. Take them yourself. My long knife does not leave her throat. Vicini watches excitedly as the man in black takes the goblets and turns his back. A moment later, he turns again, faces Vicini, and drops the Iocane packet to the kerchief. It is empty now. The man in black sits, puts one glass in front of Vicini, and the other in front of himself. All right, where is the poison? The battle of wits has begun. It ends when you decide, and we both drink and find out who is right and who is dead. But it's so simple. All I need to do is to find from what I know of you. Are you the kind of man who would put the poison into his own glass or his enemies? Now, a clever man would place the poison in his own goblet. Because he would know that only a great fool would reach for what he was given. I am not a great fool, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you. But you must have known I was not a great fool. You would count on it, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of me. You've made your decision, Ben. Not remotely. Because I okay and comes from Australia. As everyone knows, Australia is entirely peopled with criminals. And criminals are used to having people not trust them, as you are not trusted by me, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you. Truly, you have a dizzying intellect. <laughs> Wait till I get going. Where was I? Yes, Australia. And you must have suspected that I would have known the powder's origin, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of me. You're stalling now. You'd like to think that, wouldn't you? You've beaten my Turk, which means you're exceptionally strong. So you could have put it in your cup, trusting on your strength to save you. So I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you, but you also tested my Spaniel, which means you must have studied. And in studying, you must have learned that man is mortal. So you would have put the poison as far from yourself as possible, but I can clearly not choose the wine in front of me. You're just trying to trick me into giving away something. It won't work. It has worked. You've given everything away. I know where the poison is. Then make your choice. I will. And I choose. What in the world can that be? Where? I don't see anything. Ficini busily switches the goblets while the man in black has his head turned. Oh, well. I could have sworn I saw something. 
No matter. <laughs> What's so funny? I'll tell you in a minute. First, let's drink. Me from my glass, you from yours. And he picks up his goblet. The man in black picks up the one in front of him. As they both start to drink, Vicini hesitates for a moment. Then, allowing the man in black to drink first, swallows his wine. You guessed wrong. You only think I guessed wrong! <laughs> That's what's so funny! I switched glasses when your back was turned! <laughs> Fool! You fell victim to one of the classic wonders! The most famous is never get involved in a land war in Asia, but only slightly less well-known is this. Never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the line! <laughs> Martin, you take Mrs. Colbert over to Ulam's. Would you run to Virgil down the depot? Um, Virgil here, Chief, uh, he, he thinks Harvey's innocent. I'll be damned. Could I talk to you about this privately? You look here, Virgil. Colbert's wallet. We took it off overs. You think Mr. Colbert just handed it to him? I don't know. Oberst might have come along after the crime, found it, picked it up. I don't know. That's what the boy said he did. Well, I say different. When I examined the deceased, it was evident that the fatal blow had been struck at an angle of 17 degrees from the right, making it almost certain the assailant was right-handed. And what's that got to do with the price of cotton? H Harvey's a lefty, Chief. Everybody in town knows that. Pretty sure yourself, aren't you, Virgil? Virgil. Pretty fancy name for a nigger boy like you. What do they call you up in Philadelphia? They called me Mr. Tibbs. You get this man down to the depot, Wood, and I mean now. I'll have the FBI in the lab send you reports from this. Not that it'll make any difference. My God, what kind of place is this? It won't work, you hear me? I know someone had my husband killed and I'm not going to let you cover it up. I'll take that. I'm sending it in. Personally. Lock him up, Wood. Withholding evidence. Lock him up with Oberst. They'll make a sweet pair. Davy, Lizzie's abusive husband, whom she has been running from for the past nine years, is lying on a hospital bed, dying. His sister Janet is next to him, holding his hand. Lizzie slowly enters the room. Davy stirs and looks up to see his wife standing in the doorway, hope growing in his eyes. Lizzie, Lizzie. I've let myself go a wee bit. Sorry. It's been a long time. They are still beautiful. No, I'm not. I'm not beautiful. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lizzie. I'm sorry, Lizzie. Shh, Davy. Shh. It's. It's all right. It's. It's all right now. Don't cry. Where's Frankie? He's at school. He's nine now. Nearly ten. I know. Stop at geography. I always knew he was clever. Let's take that off you. Don't 
don't think so. You were the one that could have gone to college. <laughs> I want to see him, Lizzie. I've got a right to see him. Don't give me that. It's too late for fighting, Lizzie. Just let me see him. I want him to know how sorry I am. He's my son. He's not your son, he's mine. You don't deserve him. You don't deserve his forgiveness. Christ, I made one mistake, one stupid fucking mistake, and you made me pay. You've made me pay all right. You're a bitch. You're nothing but a bitch. I want to see my son. I've got the right, I'm his father. I've got rights. I've got my rights, I'm his father. You're not his father. He's got a different father now, a real father, a kind, gentle man of a father who, who, who teaches him to throw stones across the water. You could never be his father. You want to see my son? No, Davy, please, I'm no, his come on. Mother. Davy, no, stop it. That's right. Stop. Nurse. You bitch. I Nurse. want to see my son. Nurse. Lizzie runs Lizzie. out of the room, followed by Janet. <laughs> Lizzie, wait a minute. Lizzie, Lizzie, please. He nearly killed us, Janet. I know, I know. But he's only got a few days left. He can't touch you now. Let him die in peace, for your own sake. And right here, Mr. Lamar, is where we ran into the quicksand. Quicksand? Quicksand. Splendid. So now the railroad's got to go through Rock Ridge. Rock Ridge? Rock Ridge. Splendid. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Rock Ridge. Rock Ridge. Uh, be still, Taggart. My mind is aglow with whirling transient nodes of thought careening through a cosmic vapor of invention. Uh, uh, ditto. Ditto? Ditto, you provincial putz. Shut up! Yes, sir. A plan. A plan. I need a plan. Suddenly... There is a fearful crash emanating from just outside of Lamar's window. He leaps to his feet. What the hell was that? Lamar angrily storms over, pulls up the shade, and raises the window. We see a gallows set up just outside the window. Standing on top of the scaffold is a hooded hangman, Boris. Next. Boris, please. We can't hear ourselves think. Sorry, Mr. Lamar. I have two men out with the flu. It's utter chaos down here. A man in a wheelchair is wheeled up and the noose is placed around his neck. I'll try to keep it as quiet as possible, but as you can see, this one is a doozy. Oh yes, the Dr. Gillespie killings. Uh, do your best. Lamar pulls down the shade. There's an incredible crash outside as the man in the wheelchair goes through the trap door. Splendid. Now where were we? Oh yes, Rock Ridge. When that railroad comes through Rock Ridge, the property there will be worth millions. And I want it. I want that land so badly I can taste it. Shut up! Yes, sir. Unfortunately, there is one thing that stands between me and that property, and that's the rightful owners. There must be a way of scaring them out. What about killing the firstborn male child in each household? No, too Jewish. 
Well, I, I don't think we have anything to worry about. We can work up a number six on them. Number six? <laughs> I don't think I'm familiar with that one. Well, that's just where we ride into town at dawn, thrashing everything that moves to within an inch of its life. Well, except for the women, for, of, except for the women folk, of course. Oh, you you spare the women? Oh no, we rape the shit out of them at, at the number six dance that follows. Hmm, that's splendid. It sounds grotesque, but entertaining. <laughs> just might work. Why, Taggart, you've been hurt. Yes, sir. This uppity Negro hit the shovel, and I'd appreciate it if you could find it in your heart to hang him. He's locked up downstairs. Oh, consider it done. Lamar raises the window shade. Through the window, we see a rider and horse being led up to the gallows. Boris places one noose around the rider's neck and another noose around the horse's neck. Uh, Boris! I've got a special. Uh, when can you work him in? I couldn't possibly sneak him in until Monday, sir. We're booked solid. Monday. Splendid! Much obliged. And don't you worry, Mr. Lamar. We'll make Rock Ridge sorry it was ever born. Splendid! We hear a big crash from outside as horse and rider go plummeting through the trap door. Sorry! Well, today certainly shaped up in a hurry, didn't it? Behind them, Helen slowly stands up in the fountain. She's dripping wet and with a big blackened see all the way through hole in the middle of her stomach. She towers over Madeline and Ernest, who are spreading the tarp out in front of the fountain, their backs to her. Did you ever notice how some days can start out so shitty and then all of a sudden something wonderful happens and your whole outlook just changes? That was totally uncalled for. <laughs> Helen starts to climb out of the fountain. Ernest and Madeline scramble away from her across the floor, trying to get up. Ernest, look at me. Just look at me. I'm soaking wet. And there's a, a little problem with your tights. Don't sugarcoat it, Ernest. I've got a hole in my stomach. It's another miracle. It is not. You fraud. 48 miles a day, my ass. She walks over to Helen and flips back her collar, revealing a shining Simprevive pin, just like her own. This is your beauty book. This is your secret. You took the potion. How do you know about it? You took the potion too. Took what? That's why you look the way you do. And you are dead. A very select group. Ha! Some selection if they let you in. What do you mean if they let me in? I took it in New York years ago, way before you. What are you two talking about? The, the potion. potion. What potion? I took everything I had, and now look at me! I'm soaking wet! Don't forget that. And I've got a hole in my stomach! <laughs> you both took a potion? Oh, can you just try to keep up? A satanic potion! Well, I hope that little hole in your stomach teaches you a lesson. I don't think this is a miracle at all. You see what happens to people who obsess about their weight? And as a friend, let me just say, I'd stay out of a bathing suit for a while if I were you. People might call you a- Clang! Something big and heavy hits Madeline on the head from behind and she sails off her feet. Helen stands behind her, soaking wet with a hole in her stomach and holding one of her shovels. I just fixed this! Helen goes to the fountain, grabs the other shovel, and tosses it to Madeline. A challenge. Madeline catches it with one hand. On guard, bitch. 
The women start to circle each other, wielding the shovels like broadswords. Watch yourself, Madeline. You're not screwing with the same old Helen. <laughs> Did anyone? Now hold on, girls. Why don't we all just go into the kitchen, sit down, and have a really good clang? Ernest ducks at the last second as the women swing the shovels at each other, clanging them together just where his head was. Gee. I thought you'd learn not to compete with me. I always win. Clang! You may have won, but you never played fair. Clang! <laughs> Ernest backs away from them slowly up the stairs. The women's shadows fall on the stairs around him as they pitch an unholy battle, shouting, clanging the shovels off of each other, fighting like Vikings or something. You're a sore loser. Who cares if I played fair? I won, period. Clang. Just because you could raise your legs higher and wider than anyone. Clang. You mean better than anyone. Ernest reaches the top of the stairs and stops, staring down at them in horror as their shadows dance at his feet. I'll, I'll be upstairs. Downstairs, the battle rages on. Madeline swings at Helen, misses, and her shovel cracks off in the middle of the handle. Realizing she has a spear now, she chucks it at Helen, but it sails through the hole in Helen's midsection and sticks in the sofa. Wait a minute. This is pointless. Nothing even hurts. We can't even cause each other pain. Pain? She bops Madeline on top of the head with her shovel, and Madeline's head disappears between her shoulders. You want to talk about pain? Bobby Menville, Scott Hunter, Ernest Menville, that's pain. I loved every one of them, and they loved me. They... I will not speak to you until you put your head on straight. They were all I had, and you took them away. Not because you loved them, not because you cared, but just to hurt me. You hurt me on purpose. Uh, that's not true. Liar. You attacked me. Me? Did you think I was blind? Did you think I was deaf? Did you think I didn't hear what you and your snotty little friends said about me behind my back? You thought I was cheap, didn't you? Oh, that's ridiculous. Oh, then how come you never once invited me to a party at your parents' place? We just, we didn't think you'd feel comfortable. It just wasn't. Could you stop that? <laughs> It just wasn't usual for us to have trash in the house. Say it. You're avoiding the issue. You stole my boyfriends to hurt me on purpose. Uh, I, I did not. Admit it. You admit it. Look me in the eye and tell me. You thought I was cheap. Okay. I thought you were cheap. Well, I hurt you on purpose. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry too. And just like that, the air goes out of their feud. They drop their shovels and drop onto the couch in relief on opposite ends. Didn't you run with some kind of mine in Sonora? Yeah, I helped run a little copper. Nothing for us there except day wages if it was running now, which it ain't. Well, why the hell did you ever quit it? <laughs> why in hell are you still going? Well, I don't know any better. Maybe I don't want any better. Hell, I wouldn't know what to do with better if it poked me in the eye with a sharp stick. <laughs> you never gave it a chance, Pike. Well, I threw away more chances in one year than you'll ever see in your whole life. That don't mean you gotta be a damned fool like me. You got a halfway hard mouth, partner. Well, what the hell you want me to say? Just don't give me no lectures. <sighs> this is gonna be my last, too. I'm not getting around any better. Like the red-haired lady said to the white-haired judge, 
Uh, I only got so many miles left in my backside, Your Honor. And I aim to keep it moving while I'm still young enough to know what it's there for. I'd like to make one good score, then back off. Back off to what? Any ideas for next one? Persians got men all over the whole border. Every one of those garrisons is going to be getting payroll. That kind of information is kind of rough to come by. Well, I don't figure it's going to be easy, but it can be done. They'll be waiting for us. I wouldn't have it any other way. Man, you must have hurt that railroad pretty bad. They spent a lot of time and money getting that ambush set up for us. <laughs> well, I caught up to them two or three times. There was a man named Harrigan. He had a certain way of doing things. And well, uh, so I made him change his ways. When you do that to a narrow man, he can't live with it. From then on, he's got to change you, break you, just to prove that he's right. There's a hell of a lot of people, Dutch. I just can't stand to be wrong. Pride, I guess. I guess. But they can't ever forget it, that pride that being wrong or learn by it. And you and me, did we learn being wrong today? Well, I surely hope to God that we did. Where'd you find him? <laughs> well, that toothless old wreck was a real gun about 20 years back. Used to run with Thornton and me. Killed his share and more around Langry. Ambush stages all along that old board highway. He had those suede immigrants so scared they'd rather starve than go to town and buy beans for their kids. And there wasn't a sheriff in the territory to take issue. And he ain't changed. Only now he does his killing with a coffee cup. Pike? <laughs> uh. hmm? I wouldn't have it no other way either. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat.